Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. The day has finally come, the sleeper has awakened, and it is now time for us to drive the reactor transfer function. As you'll see, modeling a reactor in the Laplace domain offers an enormous degree of flexibility for analyzing reactor behavior. Our previous kinetics models were generally all restricted by some assumptions, but in the Laplace domain, pretty much anything goes. We can model really any kind of transient that we want. We'll start this derivation with our old friends, the point reactor kinetics equations. You may notice that these equations are slightly different. By convention, they include C of i instead of squiggle of i for the delayed neutron precursor concentration. But C is just a version of squiggle that has been normalized slightly differently. Ultimately, this discrepancy of notation will not make much of a difference. Now we'll assume that our system has no inhomogeneous source, which means that Q of t equals zero, and that P of t, rho of t, and C of t are all equal to some constant initial value plus some time-dependent delta value. When we substitute these equations for P, rho, and C into the point reactor kinetics equations, we see that these P naught and C i naught terms are zeroed by the time derivative. Next, we'll ignore the second order terms and recall that beta of i divided by lambda times p naught minus lambda i times c i naught is equal to zero since we assume that the rate of change of the delayed neutron precursor concentration is zero at the start of the transient. After doing this, we arrive at these simultaneous equations. We next take the Laplace transform of both sides of these equations, noting that the initial conditions for delta p and delta c give us that they are equal to zero at time t equals zero. From here we can solve for an expression for delta c of i as a function of s, and we plug this expression into our other simultaneous equations, which after moving around some terms, we arrive at this expression for delta p of s divided by delta rho of s. For a reactor, Delta rho is generally our input signal, and delta p is generally our output signal. We can encounter all sorts of reactor perturbations, such as a turbine trip or a rod ejection, which introduce a reactivity insertion into our system, and from here we'll want to solve for the effect of this reactivity insertion on our system's power. So thus, instead of using y of s and x of s, like in our previous frequency domain examples, this equation is the basic expression for our reactor transfer function for the power of a reactor as a function of different reactivity insertions. Next, we can simplify this expression by assuming that our system has one delayed group, and we can solve for the approximate roots of the characteristic equation for our transfer function using the quadratic formula, which gives us this equation. Lastly, our transient responses generally assume that the reactor starts out in a critical configuration which means that rho naught is generally equal to zero, which gives us this expression for the common form of the reactor transfer function. Our stability analyses so far have all incorporated some gain, which can drive our system into a more stable or a less stable regime. The p naught term in the reactor transfer function is effectively the gain of this system, and we'll soon see how this gain affects the stability of different reactor systems. In the rest of this lecture, we'll work some examples using this reactor transfer function, but first, let's take a minute and see how this function behaves by drawing some open-loop Bode plots for it. Looking at the open-loop gain, we see that the s term in the denominator gives us a negative 20 decibels per decade slope that extends up to infinity at low frequencies. At mid-frequencies, the gain levels out for a while, and then it continues downwards again with a slope of negative 20 decibels per decade. The phase of our reactor transfer function begins at negative 90 degrees for low frequencies, climbs up to 0 degrees, and then returns to negative 90 degrees for high frequencies. These gain and phase plots are approximate, and they will certainly change for different reactors as the constants of these equations change, which is something that we can see here for these example plots, where we see the gain and phase Bode plots for different reactors with slightly different parameters. Nonetheless, these Bode plots tell us several things about reactors. The phase for our reactor transfer function never reaches negative 180 degrees, which means that our gain margin is infinity. The gain crosses zero decibels around a frequency of 10 to the negative third, which corresponds to a phase of about negative 90 degrees, 
This means that our phase margin is about 90 degrees. Now instead of thinking of this as a system with feedback, which is equal to g of s, let's assume that we have a truly open loop system with no feedback whatsoever. Here we notice that the gain of the reactor transfer function approaches infinity at low frequencies, which means that our reactor will magnify low frequency reactivity inputs to arbitrarily large magnitudes. This actually matches the response that we would expect for a reactor. A reactor's power will increase to arbitrarily large magnitudes given some constant reactivity insertion if there is no feedback whatsoever. Thus the fact that the gain approaches infinity at low frequencies signals that without feedback that our reactor's power will contain an unbounded increasing exponential in the time domain. As we'll see later, we can remove this unbounded limitless gain by introducing feedback to our reactors. Now let's work some example problems with the reactor transfer function. We'll assume that we have a critical reactor with no feedback that sees a reactivity insertion that's described by this 5 cent delta function. Our goal is to solve for the asymptotic power of the system, and we're given that lambda equals 10 to the negative 4 seconds, beta equals 0 0.0060, little lambda equals 0.1 inverse seconds, and that the initial power of the reactor is 10 to the eighth watts. Starting with the reactor transfer function, we can substitute in the 5 cent delta function for our reactivity to get this expression for delta p of s. We can solve for the asymptotic value of this power using the final value theorem, and we see that the asymptotic power is equal to 1.005 times 10 to the eighth watts. Another option, which is actually not necessary for the stated goals of this problem, is to decompose our expression for delta p of s into partial fractions, and then to solve for the time domain expression for our power. From there, we can take the limit of this expression as t approaches infinity and obtain the same result as we got using the final value theorem. For our next example, we'll want to obtain an expression for delta p of t in response to a small step reactivity insertion. The trick here is that we'll actually work this example twice, once in the time domain and once in the Laplace domain. For the time domain solution, we'll cheat a little bit by starting with equation 6.109, where we solve the in-error equation to obtain expression for our power during a constant reactivity transient. We can convert equation 6.109 to an expression for delta p of t by subtracting p0, which also equals p0 times beta minus rho divided by beta minus rho. Next, we'll introduce the approximation that for small values of x, e to the power of x is approximately equal to 1 plus x. We use this approximation to decompose the first exponential term into two approximate terms, one of which cancels with the negative beta divided by beta minus rho term. Next, because we're given that our reactivity insertion is very small, we approximate beta minus rho as just beta. After doing all this, we see that delta p of t is roughly equal to p naught times rho times lambda divided by beta times t, plus rho divided by beta, minus rho divided by beta, times e to the negative beta divided by lambda times t. Solving this example problem is significantly easier in the Laplace domain. Our step reactivity insertion is equal to some rho divided by s in the Laplace domain, and after we combine this reactivity insertion with our reactor transfer function, we obtain this expression for delta p as a function of s. When we decompose this expression into partial fractions, we see that we'll have an a divided by s squared term plus b divided by s plus c divided by s plus beta divided by lambda. If we convert these terms back into the time domain, we see that our solution contains an a times t term plus b plus c times e to the negative beta divided by lambda times t. Wait a minute, this looks strangely familiar to our time domain solution. We can solve for a, b, and c for our partial fraction expansion and after a little bit of mathematical excruciation, we arrive at this expression for delta p as a function of t, which is exactly equal to our time domain solution. So we managed to arrive at the same solution using two completely different methods. So why is it more convenient to work in the Laplace domain? Well, recall that it took a lot of work to arrive at equation 6.109.
we introduced some approximations to first obtain the in-hour equation, and then it took quite some effort to solve this in-hour equation. In contrast, the Laplace domain work might have seemed a little bit more difficult because of the partial fraction component, but remember that it didn't start with some pre-solved equation. It started from scratch with the reactor transfer function. Moreover, the real advantage of working in the Laplace domain is that we can solve our equations for any kind of reactivity input function. We're not limited to having a step reactivity insertion. We can have a delta function, an exponential input, a time-delayed function, a sinusoidal input, or any combination of inputs that we can imagine. In chapter 8 of OTT, we solved the prompt jump approximation equations with great difficulty for a reactor's power in response to a linear ramp reactivity insertion. Solving this problem is much, much easier in the Laplace domain. Our delta rho of s term is just equal to some constant divided by s squared, and then we just wrangle the partial fraction terms from there to get our solution. This concludes our lecture on the reactor transfer function. This function will be the heart of our calculations for the remainder of this course. And in the next few lectures, we'll complicate things some more by discussing how to model a reactor with fuel and moderator feedback.